Amen. Amen. All right, here in Luke chapter number 14, towards the end of the chapter, verse number 25 is where we're going to begin. We see Jesus Christ giving advice, really giving a warning to Christians. I want you to look here in verse number 25, speaking unto disciples. He says this, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So notice, when these people are coming to him, what is it like? It's like, hey, I want to follow this man, right? That's why they're following him around, right? They, 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 they're interested in what he's saying. They're interested in his message. There's a possibility that maybe they may make the decision to be a disciple one day. Look at what it says next. Verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse number 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now I want to focus on the next couple of uh, verses here. Verse number 28, it says this, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Verse 29, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold, all that behold it begin to mock him. Verse 30, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of finishing what you start. Finishing what you start. Now here he's speaking, of course, the, the primary application is about being a disciple, about following him, about you know, uh, uh, wanting to you know, uh, be a disciple or a follower of Christ. And he uses a story here to prove a point or to, to demonstrate a point about a man that's going to build a tower, right? And he, he talks about how the importance of counting the cost. Now, I want to read it one more time. I want to focus specifically on uh, verse number 28 this time. It says this, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and then it says this, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. So notice first he starts off about the importance of before you make a decision to begin the project, before you make a decision to begin the job or to take on you know, some undertaking of some sort of work, you need to make sure beforehand that you are positive that you are going to finish this out to the end, right? You shouldn't just start something that you are not able to finish. So what's best to do, what is best to happen is that you sit down prior, you sit down beforehand and you decide, yes, I'm going to do this. I am 100% sure. You need to be sure that whatever decision you make and whatever task that you begin, that you can finish it. I want to point out the next part, verse number 29, less happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. And then it says this in verse 30, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. So he's teaching here the virtue of finishing what you start. And not only that, from Jesus Christ's own mouth, what he's teaching is that it is a shameful thing, that it is an embarrassing thing when someone starts a job when they agree to a job, when they commit and say, I'm going to do this, right? In this case, it's very public, right? I'm going to complete this. This is something that I am going to undertake. They, they commence this project, but then what happens later on down the road? They just abandon the project. And then what takes place? He says it's shameful. He says that everyone that sees it around him begins to mock him. You know what Jesus is teaching? That it is a shameful thing not to finish things that you start. It's shameful. It is embarrassing to not finish things that you have agreed to do. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 11. I'm going to begin here in the introduction with a first point. So I'm going to have four points this morning. The first point early on here uh, in the introduction is that you, you shouldn't just make decisions, you know, just impulsively or willy-nilly. You should sit down, you should count the cost, and you should be certain and sure that you are going to finish whatever project that you are beginning, whatever it may be. Now, you know, when we make the decision, obviously, to follow Christ, that's what this is being related to, we should count the, the cost. And it, this is not talking about salvation, so let me be clear about that. This is talking about being a disciple. A disciple is someone who does work. 
A disciple is someone who does work. But let me say this as well. In any area of life, in any area of life, it is a virtue to be a faithful man and someone that when they say they are going to do something, someone that says they are going to do something, someone that begins doing something, finishes that. That is a virtue of Christianity and it is embarrassing to not do so. It is embarrassing to that person. So, number one, never begin a project until you have sat down and diligently thought it through. Never begin a work, never begin a ministry, never take on a job unless you have thought 100% all aspects through and you are for sure that you are going to finish it. Sit down and think it through from beginning to end and never agree to do it until you are for sure that you are going to finish it. The second point is a very, very basic point, is that uh, the next part, after you've made the decision that you are going to do such work, then there needs to be a performance of that work. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 11. It says this, Now therefore perform the doing of it. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, that's saying you had a readiness of mind, you wanted to do this, you agreed to doing, doing it. He says this, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. So notice he's speaking to someone that has agreed to do something, that says that they want to do something. They've you know, assented to it as far as they've maybe even spoken it or just intellectually and said, I had a readiness of mind, a readiness of will. They desire to do it. Now he's saying the next step is to actually perform it. The next step is to actually get busy. So of course we can't ignore the fact that there is actually work to be done if you are starting a certain project. If you are agreeing to do something, there has to be work that is done. So the second point of course is that you have to perform it. You can't be lazy. If you agree to do something, you need to look at all aspects of it and you need to do it and you need to finish it and you need to complete the work. Zechariah chapter number 4 verse number 9 says this, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. So notice that Zerubbabel was the one that laid the foundation. Now what is the foundation? It's the beginning, right? It's the start. He laid the foundation. And it's interesting because it says his hands shall also finish finish it. He was doing the work as well. He was the one that was performing the work and he was there to help them actually do the work in the very beginning. He laid the foundation. He put the cornerstone down but guess what? The very last brick that went on, Zerubbabel was there as well for that. Right? A lot of times people start things and then they hand them off to someone else. They start a project and then they abandon it. They give it to somebody else and somebody else finishes it. Well, Zerubbabel, he started the project and he finished the project. He had a readiness to will. He knew that he wanted to do it. He agreed to do it. He laid the foundation, but then he also put on the capstone. He completely finished the entire job from beginning to end. This is an important virtue. And it is, I want to repeat this a few times and I know we're going to get in this at the end. We need to not be the type of Christians that start jobs and then abandon the jobs. Whatever it may be, in secular, you know, a ministry, whatever it may be. If we agree to something, hey, there are exceptions. But if we agree to do something, we need to think it through. We need to make sure that we're going to do it. We need to make sure that this is something we're going to carry out unto the end. We need to lay the foundation and we need to finish it to the end. I want you to go with me now to Exodus chapter number 39, verse number 32. Exodus chapter number 39, verse number 32. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 39, verse number 32. <clears throat> so God used many, many men throughout, of course, the... Uh, the history of the, of the scriptures, of what's recorded. There was many men that God chose out. He had particular tasks that needed to be done. Ministries, of course, meaning work that needed to be complete. And God chose out men and he told them what he wanted them to do. He would give them an outline, right? He came to Moses and Moses had a job from beginning to end. His job was to bring the children of Israel into the soon-to-be land of Israel, Canaan, right? The promised land. That was his job, right? 
Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 2, tells us that Moses was faithful to that job. It says this, Who was faithful to him that appointed him, that's Jesus, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse number 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. That's talking about Jesus Christ built the house. He's the creator. Verse number uh, uh, five says this, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Now watch this, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. There are a lot of great men in the Bible. There are a lot of great men that serve as great examples. And those things are recorded in the Bible to be examples to us on how we should be as men or how we should be as women, how we are supposed to live our lives and the type of character that we should have in our lives. Moses was given a job and Mo Moses finished that job. Moses agreed to God when God came to him that he was going to take on the task that God had for him. And Moses carried it out all the way unto the end. Moses finished it all the way unto the end. And God now, when the scriptures are written, the book of Hebrew and the New Testament, looking back on what Moses did, God says that that was written to begin with you know, at the time that Moses did this, so that it could be an example to us today. So what he did and the way he worked and how he was faithful could show us how we should be faithful today. I want you to look at me first, look at uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 39, verse number 32. Exodus chapter number 39, verse number 32. It says this, we'll begin in verse, uh, actually begin in, in verse 25. I want to, there's, there's a pattern here and, and we're going to be jumping around a lot. I'm not going to read every single one of them. But obviously, uh, let me say this as a preface before we get into here. Moses was given a great deal of work to do. Many different things happened under the leadership of Moses. The tabernacle was built, you know, just the institution of the laws and actually putting them out, the priesthood. There was a massive amount of work that Moses was entrusted with, a massive amount of work. And I want you to notice here the obedience of Moses in every area from beginning to end. He agreed to do the work and he did all of it. He did every bit of it. I want you to look here at verse number, we'll start in, um, um, I don't want to do 21. Let's look at verse 26. This is just talking about the priest's garments. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, round about the hem of the robe to minister in. It says, as the Lord commanded Moses. I want you to look down at verse 29. And a girdle of fine twine linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. You'll see this pattern repeatedly. Look at verse 31. And they tied unto it a lace of blue to fasten it on high upon the miter. Watch this. As the Lord commanded Moses. Over and over and over again. Who is trusted with this particular work to get done? Moses, as Moses was commanded. I want you to look now at verse number, we'll skip to verse 32, at where we were going to begin. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, notice this, finished. And the children of Israel did according to all the Lord, all that the Lord commanded Moses. And then it says, so did they. Now, of course, the children of Israel were obedient as well. But Moses was the one that was given all of these particular precepts, all of these particular intricacies about the tabernacle, how it was supposed to look. And then under his leadership, he had to you know, uh, organize and manage all of the work to get done. That's why I kept mentioning who was the responsible one for finishing this. As the Lord commanded Moses. Over and over again, as the Lord commanded Moses. What's the point in that? That's giving praise to Moses is what that's doing. That's saying, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Of course, you can learn from it as well that he did it exactly like that. But that's again, that's showing that Moses did not deviate from the commandment that he was given. As the Lord commanded Moses. And I want you to notice as well that it tells you this in the beginning of verse 32. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished. Who was entrusted with that? Moses. Notice, thus was all the work. Thus was all the work of the tent, of the tabernacle of the tent, of the congregation finished. So notice, he finished that work, didn't he? Everything that had to do with the tabernacle, it says that he finished that work. And then it goes on. Uh, at the end, of course, to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. Look at chapter 40, verse 16. I want you to see this, this strong consistency and how it almost feels redundant. Look at verse 16. Thus did Moses... 
according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. What's the point of that verse? The same point that we saw before. It's to show the obedience, the faithfulness, and how he was given a job, and he's doing every piece of it. Every single part. He begins, he lays the foundation, he starts from the very beginning, and then he continues to do the work, and he's seeing it out unto the end. Look at verse 19. It says, And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering of the tent above upon it, as the Lord commanded Moses. Over and over and over again. Verse 23. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then it just continues on. Verse 25. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Do you see how this is redundant? Extremely redundant. Look at verse 27. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. Look at verse 29, the very end of it. We're not going to read the whole verse. It tells you again, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now I want you to look at verse 33. Now I want you to notice this very clearly. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Now that gives you an idea of why it was repeatedly telling you over and over again, as the Lord commanded Moses. Moses was very clearly the one that was entrusted with these commandments, with these, these, these details about the tabernacle, with these details about the congregation. Of course, this was very important. You know, this had to do with the priests. It was a figure of, of you know, Christ coming when they would go in and, uh, and they would sacrifice the lamb. This is very important. And he had been entrusted with this. And notice that he began the work. He started the work from the very beginning and he did each individual commandment, but what does it say at the very end? Verse number 33, so Moses finished the work. God gave him a job to do. He began that job, you know what he did? He finished the work. That's big. He finished the work that God had given him. This is point number three. Finishing is being 100% complete. Finishing is being 100% complete. To, to finish something is to be complete. It is to be 100% complete. It's not 90, 98% complete. It's not 99% complete. And I think it's very interesting that when God gives you everything that Moses did, he goes one by one by one. But notice there was a time in which he was actually finished. There was a time in which when those curtains were hung up, that he was done. Now, prior to that, had Moses finished the work that God had given him? He had not. He was given a job. He was entrusted with a job to, to, to build and to put up the tabernacle, right? Did he finish that work before he had hung the curtains? Because that was the very last thing that he did. He had not, right? He would not have been finished with the work yet. A lot of times when people do where you probably can think of someone in your mind like this, and you know, we can, everybody can do this from time to time. A lot of times when, when uh, uh, you know, uh, people are doing work, They'll get mental blocks in their mind at one point. And you probably know people like this. And I can, I can think of someone that is, that is a very, very close relative to me that does this constantly. And you, you, know, you go around this person's house, you look at things that they've done. They get this mental block where they start doing work. And they always get to the very, very end. And there's just the finishing, just the finishing touches that need to go on it. And then they stop. And then they move on to another project. Has anybody ever seen anybody, anyone like that? I know tons of people like that, but I know a particular person that's very close to me that does that all the time. They get to the very end of the project, and there's like almost nothing left to do, but there's almost that people can get a mental block in their mind, right? Where they just abandon the project at the very, very end. All they have left basically is just to hang the curtains up. And they don't hang the curtains. And you know what they have sitting there? An unfinished project. They have an incomplete project, a project that they agreed to do, a project that they in their mind said, I'm going to get this done. But truth be told, when you look at the project, it's not finished. It's not done. You never finish this project. And I know this person, you can walk around their house and you just walk through their house and there's all these just finished projects. I plan on getting to that. I plan on getting to this. I plan on getting to that. Now we can all do this to a degree. I'm talking about when it becomes habitual, when it becomes a way of life. Now, it's different than being busy and not just finishing something that you put off for a few months and then get to, right? I'm talking about where this becomes a routine where you have everything that you begin, you never finish it. Where you just never finish it. 
This is a major problem. It's a problem to the point where people will look at you and mock. Where people will look at you and make fun of you. Where Jesus Christ tells a parable and likens it unto the Christian life and he says that it's embarrassing. That's what he's teaching. It's embarrassing when someone agrees to finish something because you know what you're saying? I don't have the character to see this out to the end. I don't have the integrity to see this out to the end. And what these people will do is they'll start a project, they'll get to the very end, they'll abandon the project, and then go start another project. Finish what you were doing in the first place and then move on to that other project. God had work that He gave to Moses and He gave particular commandments. He gave this, this series or list of commandments to finish. And Moses was eating away at those commandments. But you know, he was not done and he was not finished and he had not completed his work until the curtains were hung. And you know what God would have told him if Moses would have came to him and said, Lord, look at what I've done. Look how great this looks. You know what God would have said? He would have said, it's not finished. It's not done. Do you know how I know that? Because the Holy Spirit tells you when it was finished and when he was satisfied with it. He tells you very, very clearly. And you, and, and you can see that God is giving Moses praise. You know what else that proves? that it's important to finish the work that you've been given. It's important to finish the work that you've been given. Just like God gave Zerubbabel praise. When he talked about Zerubbabel laying the foundation and finishing it with his own hands. So it says there that Moses finished the work. It says, so Moses finished the work. And that was point number three. When you start something, you need to finish it to the very end. It needs to be 100% Complete, 100% complete. I want you to turn now with me to go to Acts chapter number 20, verse number 24. Anyway, I, I personally don't understand how people, when people get like that, how they are able to just walk away from something being just undone. It bothers me. When I look at it every time, it would bother me if there's some little thing that needs to be finished. It irritates me and eats away at me. And not only that, there's a sense, there's a unique sense, really, of satisfaction. when, when It's like when you put the, Christ, the, the Christmas star up on top of the Christmas tree. Like the whole thing is finished. That is the finishing touch, right? There's a unique sense of satisfaction when you put that last coat of paint on something. When you put that last piece of trim and then you step back and you know mentally, I agreed to do this and I completed it. There's a sense of satisfaction when you have the job 100% complete. And when you're 99% complete, you never get that sense of fat satisfaction. That never, you never receive that until you're totally done. You can wipe your hands you know, of it and walk away. You can wash your hands of it and walk away. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7 verse number 8 says this, Better is the end of a thing then the beginning thereof. And then it tells you, and the patient in spirit is better in the proud in spirit. You turn to Acts chapter 20, verse number 24, correct? Acts chapter number 20, verse number 24. If that's not where you turn, that's where we're going. Acts chapter number 20. Look at verse number 24. It says this. <clears throat> this is Paul speaking. Uh, but none of these things move me. He's saying, I'm unfazed. Speaking about uh, you know, the possible loss of life and all the persecution he's going through. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. And then he says this, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now notice there that, that Paul talks about the importance of finishing his course. Finishing his race, if you will. What is the course according to this passage? He says this, and the ministry. And the ministry. What is a ministry? What is the word? What does it mean to minister? It means to do work. That's what it means. It means to do work. He's been entrusted with a specific work, right? He says that repeatedly, that he was entrusted. He was given the work of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his job, right? He says here that, he, that when it comes to his priorities... That even his own life, he's willing to sacrifice that he might finish the work. He says, neither count I my life dear. And then he tells you why. So that I might finish my course with joy. So you see how important it is that Paul was given a job. Paul was entrusted with the ministry of preaching the gospel to the world. Do you, know, you see how important it is to Paul to finish the work that he had been given? 
It was so important that he says, I'm willing to go to Jerusalem. I'm willing to go anywhere that I need to go. Even if I have to put my life you know, in danger, I'm willing to do that. Because the most important thing to me is finishing the work that I've been entrusted with. The most important thing to me is finishing the ministry and, and, and finishing my course. And he says, with joy. He wants to finish it with joy. I want you to go now to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter number 13. This act also ties in with where we began there in Luke 14. You see that following Christ can be, uh, can be the possibility of, of, of the loss of life, of, of danger of even maybe losing your own life. And that there has to be you know, a, 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 an attitude where you understand that I'm willing to sacrifice my own life. I'm willing to sacrifice the things that are important to me. My priorities have to be the Lord Jesus Christ, my Christian, my Christian life, and the church, and, you know, uh, uh, spiritual things. That has to be the... You know, that's why, that's why Jesus, when he's sitting there, he, he begins this whole... Both of these parables, he begins with, if anyone wants to come after me, you know, all these people are following him. He says, if anyone wants to come after me and be a disciple of me, he needs to hate his own life. He needs to hate his... You know, all, he lists off all of his family's life. He needs to hate all of this. Be, be willing to forsake it is his point. That's what he means by hating it. He needs to be willing to forsake it if anyone wants to come after me. You need to have the... And what do you see Paul having here? Neither count I my life... You know, uh, 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 neither count I my life... What is the word that he uses? Dear. That's what he says, right? I kept wanting to say joy from the last part of it. Neither count I my life dear. What's he saying? I'm willing to give it all to follow Christ. I'm willing to sacrifice everything to follow Christ. And that's why Jesus gave that whole commandment, or that whole uh, 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 you know, warning or admonition, if you will, about if you want to come after me... There's going to be a sacrifice. If you want to follow me, there's going to be a sacrifice. That the way in which when people follow me, I have to be their priority. I have to be what's important to them. Look here in Acts chapter number 13. It's, it's very interesting, again, when we see someone finishing their course. And, and Luke 14 was talking about, hey, if you want to decide to be a disciple, you need to finish it out. And I want to give you a warning beforehand that it could be a possible loss of life. It could be a possible, you know, uh, endangerment of, of a loss of life, of your own life. Look at, it's, it's interesting because look here at Acts 13, verse 25. Notice what it's talking about here. Acts 13, verse 25. <clears throat> and as John fulfilled his course, that's John the Baptist, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. What did he say that John did? He finished his course. What's a course? According to Paul in, 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 uh, in chapter 20, what was it? It was his ministry. What's he saying? John finished his ministry. John finished his course. When Paul said that he wanted to finish his course, what did he say? Neither count out my life dear. How did John the Baptist finish his course? Death, didn't he? You see how this kind of you know, becomes, how the whole picture starts to come together? Where what's the possibility when you start the Christian life as far as being a disciple of Christ? You know what you need to understand from the very beginning? That there's a possible loss of life. Now we may not, we may not understand this because we don't live in times of persecution. But let me say this, in the past 2,000 years, most of the time when you were outwardly a Bible-believing Christian, there were, in most centuries in the past 2,000 years, there was the possible loss of life. Under the Roman Empire, under the Roman Catholic Church, all the way up to the 16th, and, and, and even in the 1600s, 1700s. You know, the King James Bible is great and precious, and, and, and it's, the, it's the greatest thing in the world, but you know, King James wasn't, you know, he was not a saved believer. I don't know if you know this, but the people that came over on the Mayflower, when the people that wrote the Mayflower Compact, the whole purpose that they left themselves was because King James was trying to kill them for not, you know, they, they was, he was persecuting and putting people to death for not worshiping exactly the way that he wanted people to worship. You know, Anabaptists were persecuted by the Protestants, which are our forefathers. Anabaptists were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants, the Church of England, all of them. So the persecution for Baptists and Bible believers did not end, you know, in 1500s, like the 14th century, 15th century era. era. That's not when it, when it was completed. That's not when it totally stopped. It was, it was a, a couple of hundred years after that. Even John Calvin was putting Anabaptists to death in, uh, where, where he, in Geneva. He was putting Anabaptists to death there. 
the majority, that's two, three hundred years ago. You understand that? So there were times of reprieve during those years. There were breaks in between where maybe they stopped persecuting them for a period of time. But my point is this. Over the past 2,000 years, the majority, the vast majority of those centuries, Christians were being put to death. Real Christians were being put to death. Now, today, we may not realize that. We may not see that. But there are areas even today in this, in this uh, 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 year, 2019, where Christians are being put to death in other areas. This is a real fear of following Christ. And there, this will eventually, and you can see it where people are becoming, the person that is, has the biggest target on their back as far as who's losing liberties and, who's re and who you can see the, you know, uh, in, the, in the future who is going to be uh, uh, you know, persecuted the most is the, the real Bible-believing Christian. The one that's willing to stand up and preach all of the offensive stuff. What the people today in the world hates the most are the offensive, is the offensive preaching of the Bible and calling out sin and calling you know, a spade a spade. That is what is the most intolerable thing about this, you know, this snowflake generation type people today. That's what they hate the most. That is what irks them the most. And, and you can see slowly where we're moving back towards where Christians are receiving the persecution again. Where real Christians that say, hey, I believe the Bible, I believe that. You know, uh, adulterers should be put to death. Homosexuals should be put to death. I believe that kidnappers should be put to death. I believe these things. Those are the people that are receiving the persecution more than anyone right now. What do you think is going to happen in a hundred years? You think you're just going to get all, every, the whole country is just going to get converted back to being an Anabaptist? Which they weren't in the first place. Do you think everybody's just going to come back to fundamentalism in some degree? Where everybody's a pilgrim? And Plymouth Brethren? No. It's not going to happen. We're moving away from that. Where they're not putting up with it anymore. And there's going to be a time. So you know what you need to do is you need to... You, that could be in your lifetime. You need to understand that now. Because there's going to be a time probably in your life when it's not... And if it's not, you know, putting you to death, it's throwing you in prison. I guarantee before my life, I guarantee it before my life, some of the sermons that I can just freely preach right now without any, without any legal action taken against me, there will be legal action in the end of my life. I guarantee... I, I don't... I feel very, very confident about that. That if I stood up, you know, in my 70s and 80s in this country and I stood up and said homosexuals should be put to death and called them queers and fags and things like that, I guarantee that I would go to jail. I guarantee. Canada, you, if you stood up behind a pulpit and said faggot, you'd go to jail that day. That is illegal. You cannot say that. If you go to work, they'll fire you. It's, it, it, it's actually a law in Canada. That's a Western country. That's in the Western civilization who supposedly has all the rights and the freedoms. You don't think that's going to happen here eventually? If in your life, you know, the, the, the Antichrist doesn't come and God forbid... But the Antichrist doesn't come and, and there's a real new world order in your life. You will be, you will be jailed for some of the things that you are, can openly say and, and that you believe today. You know what you need to do? You need to count the cost. You need to understand where this course finishes. Seriously. Things may not be that way now, but they will be eventually. They will be soon. That's how it was with the disciples in the first place. It didn't start off that way. They became, even the Jews became more fed up with their preaching as time went on. And then they started jailing them. And then people started getting put to death. And then it got worse and worse and worse. That's how everything happens. All of it. That's how it happens. In all societies, all cultures. You need, to, you need to count the cost. You need to realize where the course finishes. And sometimes, you know, uh, like John the Baptist, he ended up on a platter, literally. That's sometimes, and you know what God said? He finished his course. He finished the work. And that's what it is sometimes. Neither count I my life dear. Neither count I my life dear. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. So there Paul was saying in Acts 20, we read a moment ago, how he was going to do anything that he had to do, even the possible loss of life, so that he could finish his course. That was what was important to him. He was going to make sure that was his priority. 
I'm going to finish my course. I'm, what was his course? His ministry. He said, I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to finish my race. I've started this, and I'm not just laying the foundation and walking away. You know, I, I laid the foundation, and I'm finishing it. I'm going to lay that last stone, as Zerubbabel did. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Notice what he said. He said, I have fought a good fight. And then he says these words. I have finished my course. Don't you think he was satisfied? Don't you think that was the feeling that I was talking about? About that, 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 that uh, unique satisfaction of completion of a project? He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And then he says, I have kept the faith. Verse 8. Notice that there's a reward for finishing your course. Look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. So firstly we saw... Don't start something unless you are 100% sure you are going to finish it. Don't agree to something unless you are for sure going to finish it. Make sure that you have thought it out very well. Be diligent. Don't impulsively or spontaneously say, I'll do it. Because it's embarrassing when you end up not finishing it. It's embarrassing when you lay the foundation, you put the work in, and then you just have this, this incomplete project. You walk away that's just sitting there in your life. And you just weren't able to finish it. You know, even, even Moses talks about, and the people of, and the children of Israel talk about, how it would be embarrassing when he starts to, you know, uh, 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 lose faith, if you will, or, or, to, or to swagger in his faith. When he's walking, when they're out in Egypt, or they're out in, uh, I'm sorry, in the desert, they're wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, and he says, you know, uh, how, how all the other nations will mock if, they just, he, if the Lord just brings them out there and, and kills them because they'll say, the Lord brought him out of Egypt, but he wasn't able to bring him into the promised land. Why? Because it's embarrassing. When you start a project and you invest energy, and you invest time, and you commit to it, do you know what it looks like to everybody else? He doesn't have the character. He either doesn't have the ability, or he doesn't have the character to finish it. That's why it's important when you begin a project, you better firstly look at the project. Think about the project. Look at the work. Think about the ministry. Think about what it entails before you make some spontaneous decision, some impulsive decision, and commit to it. Secondly, the second point was there needs to be a performance of the work. When you agree to it, you can have a readiness of mind. You can have a readiness of will, as it says. You can want to do it, but there needs to be the performance. You need to actually... Get up off your butt and pick up a stone and lay it. You need to actually start doing something. You need to start doing that work. There needs to be a performance of the work. You need to put your hand to the plow, right? You need to begin the work. Thirdly, to finish something means that you are 100% complete. 100% complete. You need to finish it all the way unto the end. 100%. You need, to let, you need to hang that last curtain. God gave Moses a course or a series of jobs to do, and he wasn't done until he did the very last part. Until he did the very last commandment. That's when he was finished. So you need to be 100% complete. There needs to be nothing left undone. Nothing left to do. It needs to be 100% complete. Now, fourthly, is this. You need to finish even through adversity. I want you to turn to Hebrews 12. You need to finish even through adversity. Even with opposition. You need to finish even with opposition or adversity. Whatever it may be that you're doing, you need to finish through adversity or opposition. I want you to notice Hebrews 12. It talks about Jesus having a course. He had a race to run, right? He had a job to do. God entrusted him with a work and entrusted him with a ministry. And I want you to notice what it says here in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 1. It says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That'd be like our course, right? The race that is set before us. Now watch verse 2. 
Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So now he's going to use Jesus as an example of how he finished his course, as should we finish our course or finish our race. He says this, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now notice that it was the joy that compelled him. It was the joy that motivated him. Just like Paul said that it was the joy that motivated him. Notice it was the joy that motivated him. It says this, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, does that sound like it's easy or hard or something that he had to put up with or push through? It's hard, right? He endured. There was adversity. He endured the cross. And watch this. Despising the shame. He didn't go through the motions. He despised when people spat on him. He didn't like that. It bothered him. When people were, when he was there being made a mockery in front of everyone, they were hitting him and smacking him. He's all bloody. He's being just abused and pushed around and he looks to the, you know, the people weak. It says he despised the shame. He hated the shame. But look what it says. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But notice, that joy was what motivated him to get through that hard times. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. When it says contradiction, it would be like saying opposition. That's what that means there. Such opposition of sinners. It's talking about the people that were fighting against him. Those that were hitting him and, and beating him up. It's saying consider the opposition that he had to, the adversity that he had to put up with. So we wouldn't use contradiction exactly like that today. But that's what it's saying. It's saying, for consider him that endured such contradiction, or as I said, opposition of sinners against himself. And then he says this. Notice how it's a motivation to you, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. You know what he's saying? In your minds. He's saying what he put up with is way worse than what you put up with. Do you know how I'll prove that to you? Look at the, verse, the next verse. Now I want you to keep in mind everything I said about the possible loss of life. Being willing to sacrifice your own life. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Do you notice what it says? Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Do you know why he says that? Because there's a possibility you might have to resist unto blood. What's that saying? A contradiction or an opposition, an adversity that might be an attack, a physical attack, a possible loss of life. Saying in your life, at this point, in your course or your race personally, the Hebrews that he's writing to, ye have not yet resisted unto blood. Saying a real flesh and blood battle. Whereas people are beating you like they were beating him. Or putting him like they put him to death. You haven't had to put up with a possible loss of life yet. So this can be a motivation to us especially because we don't put up with persecution to the point of physical beatings or physical harm today, do we? So he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then he says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And then he says this, lest ye be wearied in your own mind. He was able to finish his course when it's a whole lot harder than yours. Proving that you could do it yourself as well. That's his point. He said, and then he goes on, Paul even says like, you don't have it that hard, my friend. You've not yet resisted unto, unto blood. You haven't had the opposition of when someone is, is trying to beat you or physically harm you. But do you know what you need, to, you need to keep in mind? You need to count the cost beforehand, the Christian life. Notice how even the warning here about finishing the course, finishing the race, what's the warning? You've not yet saying, there's a real possibility if you want to follow Christ, you're going to have to pick up a cross. You're going to have to endure persecution. You're going to have to go through a possible, you know, uh, uh, physical beating, a physical harm, you know, real serious persecution, being jailed, maybe even loss of life. Jesus endured the cross. He endured through all of this. Matthew 26, 39 says this, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That cup is his course. That's his race. That's his work or his job that he must do. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Notice what his priorities were. His priorities were doing what God wanted him to do. His course was what was important to him. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. What were Paul's priorities? His course. Number one was making sure I finish my course. I finish my ministry. John 18, 11. You turn to John 17. John 18, 11 says this. Then Jesus, 
Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Notice, he's determined that he's going to finish this no matter what. In adversity. He's praying and what does he say? In that adversity, he says, Not as I will, but as thou will. He's going to finish the work. John 17, 4. John chapter number 17, verse number 4. See Christ talking about finishing his work. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Go over to John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. <clears throat> Philippians 1, 6 talks about God finishing the work. God always finishes his work, of course. Finishing the work that he's going to do in us. It says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Notice that. Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said earlier in the book of Corinthians. He talked about, hey, you have a readiness of will. Now there needs to be a performing of that. Right here it talks about, hey, God began this work. He laid this stone, right? saying he will perform it. Now that's uh, so clearly, of course, speaking about salvation. And it's another, you know, there are so many testaments of eternal security saying he began the work and he's going to finish the work. He's the one that started it. And then notice it even mentions until the, the exact wording is this. Uh, verse number, Philippians 1, 6, it says, until the day of Jesus Christ. That's obviously his coming. When are we sealed until? Exactly. The day of redemption, which is the day of Jesus Christ. Notice, the work that he did is referring to salvation. It's talking about giving us the Holy Spirit and that he will preserve you. He will keep you sealed. He will you know, uh, keep us saved and in his hand and safe and keep our everlasting life. He's the one responsible for that, not ourselves. He is. He finishes the work. Say, man, I got to keep being a good person to get to heaven. You got it all messed up. You're so confused, he performs it from beginning to end. When it comes to salvation, just like Zerubbabel, that's a good picture of that. I just thought of that. Zerubbabel is actually called the branch in the book of Zechariah. He, just like how Jesus is the branch because there's the immediate fulfillment. And you see Jesus doing what? He builds the church. What do you have Zerubbabel doing? What's the church? The house, right? The house of God. The building. He talks about the building and the prophets and all that. What does Zerubbabel do? He lays the, the foundation, like Jesus is the foundation. He puts the, you know, the first stone down, and guess what he does also? He finishes it. That's like our salvation. That's him beginning our salvation, being the author, but also finishing our salvation. The author and finisher of our faith. So you're in John chapter number 19, verse number 30. Here's, here is Jesus in the middle of you know, enduring the contradiction of sinners, of being beaten, and all the adversity, it says this. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Where did his course end? In death. That's where his course ended. It ended in death. So you see the reason why he warns, hey, if you want to start a course, what is a course? What did Paul say his course was? Ministry. It's the work. Being a disciple of Christ, it's, it's doing work for Christ. Number one, that course has to be number one. That course has to be priority. And number two, when you start it and you say, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be a disciple of Christ, I'm going to do work or a ministry for Christ, I'm going to see it out unto the end. And he even warns you beforehand, I want to mind you that there is a possibility of loss of life. I want to mind you that there is a possibility that... There could be physical harm. That, that ministry, that work, that discipleship needs to be number one priority. You need to not, he says, I count not my own life dear. Paul didn't count his life dear. And he said, why? That I might finish my course. So notice that he had to what? He had to hate his own life only. He had to understand, hey, what is the priority here? The priority is finishing my course, finishing my ministry. We see here that Christ finished his course. And what did he do it? In the face of adversity. He did it in the face of adversity. You need to understand before you begin discipleship, before you begin ministry, before you begin the work of the Lord, you need to understand beforehand that it's not easy and that there are things down the road that are, you're going to receive opposition, contradiction, adversity down the road. So you need to know that beforehand, before you pull the trigger, number one. But not only that, 
When you face the adversity, you better endure it. Not just bail out. Not just quit the ministry. Not just quit being a disciple. Not just stop going to church. Not just stop serving Christ. When things get a little bit difficult and there's a little heat on you, just putting your hands up and walking away. It's embarrassing. It's shameful when people do that. When people step out of the Christian life, hey, I feel bad for people in certain situations. When people stop serving God, they completely abandon the ministry, they stop doing work for the Lord, it's embarrassing. And it's shameful. It really is. It's just like when people get married. How embarrassing and shameful is it when you get a divorce? And you remember back when those people stood there and they made the commitment, hey, until death do us part. Did they really mean it? No, when you say that, what do you need to do? What do people tell you beforehand before you get married? You've heard this, and people may not say it that much anymore, but when I was a kid and I heard advice given to, to people that were engaged or people that were going to be married one day or even just the discussion of marriage and advice given from an adult to a child, you know what they'd say? When you get married, you better make sure that person's the right one or that you want to be with that person. Why? Because if you start it, you have to finish it. You know what is embarrassing when, when someone ends up getting a divorce? It's shameful. It is. It's, it's, it's shameful and it's embarrassing. It's the same thing with the course and the discipleship of Christ. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy again. 2 Timothy 4. Now what fueled and what motivated Christ? Because you say, hey, how do you get through the times of adversity? How do you get through the hard times when they come? John 4, 34 says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his, his work. Notice what actually got him through was the idea of getting the job done at the end. Of finishing the work. What gets, I mean, it's, 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 it's so simple you could say this. What is it that uh, 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 someone that's running a race, what is it that motivates them? The finish line. That's what motiv motivates them. It's the finish line. Do you know what motivated Jesus? It mo what motivated Jesus was the finish line. Finishing the work, he said. He said, my meat, what, what fuels your body is food, right? So he's paralleling that. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And he says this, and to finish his work. You know what he was minded about? Finishing the work. That's what motivated him, was finishing his course. I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy 4. We're going to end here. 2 Timothy 4. Look at verse 7 again. We read this previously. Look at verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Verse 9, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. So right after he got done telling you that he finished his course, he finished his race, notice what he says next. Verse 10, <clears throat> for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So I want you to notice there, after he gets finished saying, D you know, I finished my course, I finished my race, and you can hear, you can read that he's joyful. You can read that he has that sense of satisfaction, doesn't he? It's very clear. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He has that sense of satisfaction of putting that last coat of paint on. Putting that last piece of trim on the finished carpentry uh, face. He's totally done, 100% done, and he's happy. And he stepped back and he's happy about it. I'm happy that I finished my course. I finished the work. You don't think Moses, when the tabernacle was done, stepped step back and, and, was, and <sighs> was happy that he was finished? He was happy that he was done. He was happy that he was finished. Right after that, he says this in verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know what Demas didn't do? He didn't finish his course. He had a ministry that he was given and he didn't finish his race. When you read that, do you know what thought pops in your mind every single time? That's embarrassing. That's shameful. That's what, when I read that, and I know I've heard it preached that way a million times, and I've heard other people give me their opinion about that. That's embarrassing. You know what? That's not included in the Bible for you to give praise to Demas. And notice he points out the reason why. 
It's, it's to put Demas down. He says, having loved this present world. That's embarrassing. Do you know what causes people not to finish their course and not to finish their race? Loving this present world. Look at any Christian that's ever fell. Look at any pastor that began a ministry and quit. Isn't that embarrassing? Starts a church and then ends up leaving. Not finishing their... And you know, it, it can be a few different things. It can be that you fall into sin. It can be that the world steals your heart away. You know, what, you know, what happened at Steadfast... I mean, can that be any more embarrassing and shameful? He had a ministry and a work that he began, didn't he? Did he finish it? That's embarrassing. Five years into it or something? That's ridiculous. That's embarrassing and that's shameful. You know what it was about? Having, loving, ha having loved this present world. That's why. You know what's going to prevent you from... Finishing your course or finishing your race, your love for this present world. You need to mine things that are in heaven. That's what you need to mine. Not earthly things. You need to mine things that are in heaven. You know where your joy should be? In heaven. You know what you should be looking forward and looking toward? Heaven. The Bible talks about not, you know, not you know, setting your treasures up on earth. You shouldn't be assembling treasures on earth. Your treasure should be in heaven. We, we need to understand that we're just pilgrims and we're strangers Amen. in this earth. And that this world has nothing for us. And we need to have the attitude that real discipleship, if you really want to follow Christ, if you want to go listen to Him preach, you know what He's going to say to you? He's going to turn around He's going to tell you, hey, you know, this is the beginning, these first couple of steps here. But this is, this is the attitude you should have. If you're going to take these couple steps, you need to be willing to take the last steps across the finish line too. If you're going to lay the first brick, you better be there to lay the last one. If you're going to begin the race when the, when the gun goes off, you better make it across the finish line. If you pour the foundation, you want to build a tower, okay. But you better finish it. And Jesus even says... It's embarrassing when you don't. It's worth mockery when you don't. That's embarrassing what Demas did. And hopefully he got everything right, but you know what? He still serves as... He could have gotten back into the race later. I hope he did. But he still serves as an example to us of those that don't finish their course. Right after Paul said, hey, I finished my course, Demas did not finish his course. There's going, to be, there's going to be people that join our church that are super strong Christians that, that are here for years. They're going to not finish their course. And there's going to be other people that do finish their course. This is life. This is, I, I, I have seen it happen so many times. People that, that were super strong Christians that went to the church that I went to don't attend anywhere now. Read their Bible all the time. Was at every Bible study. I have a few different people in mind. Went soul winning. They, they stopped, they, you know, something happened in my church where that pastor left when I was in Arizona. They left with him and went to his church for a couple years. There's a particular guy that was extremely zealous. I mean, very zealous. Doesn't go to church now, hardly ever. I think he goes like once every three or four months. It's not his priority. He's always going, you know, and doing stuff, you know, uh, uh, with, with his kids' games. He's posting stuff on Facebook all the time. That's what he's always doing. And I asked my dad, because he talked to that pastor. I asked him, you know, is he still going to church and stuff? He's like, well, I actually seen Dave at a funeral, Pastor Dave at a funeral the other day. He said that he comes like once every three or four months. That's, you know what that is? That person, I'm not going to say his name, forsook the ministry, forsook the work of the Lord. Why? What's the reason? It's, every, it's the same every time, having loved this present world. That's the reason why. This is biblical discipleship. This is biblical discipleship and, the, and being a disciple of Christ, you have a course, you have a ministry. When you begin it, there can be things that can throw your mind off during the way. There can be, persecution can sometimes, of course, cause people to want to step back. You, life is like this. Your whole life is going to be like this. It's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. You need to be disciplined enough mentally that if you, if you said you were going to finish the course, you better finish the course. 
you need to make sure that you need to have persistence. Amen. There's a readiness to will, but there needs to be a performance. There needs to be where the work is actually getting done. So yes, first agree to it and say yes. Think it out. Make sure you're going to do it. Once you take those first couple steps in the race, that's the performance, right? You need to make sure that you finish to the end. All the way, 100%. Point number three. 100% cross the finish line. Don't get to the end of the finish line and then just stop beforehand. You're not even going to be on the roster or on the list of people that... You're not even like, you know, person 27, 28. You're not even on there. You don't have an order of when you finished. You're not, you didn't complete the race at all, period. They're not even going to remember your name. Really. They're not even going to know who you are. It's like you didn't even run the race. Why even begin it? So you need to make sure that you finish it 100% completely. And number four, this is the last point that I'm ending on here. Remember when you agree to it, you understand that Christ warned you. You need to hate your own life. Everything in this world, you need to understand that that is not my priorities. And as Paul said, neither count I my life dear. Why? What should be your priority? That I might finish my course. That I might finish my course. That needs to be our priority. And when adversity comes, don't bail. That's why when, when that's why, who, why do you think they came up with the wedding vows? You know, when they, about, about uh, you know, how's it worded exactly? Through difficult, what is it? Through hard things, does anybody know? I've never done a wedding yet, so I've never memorized them. Through good and through worse or something, richer, or poorer, right? Sickness and health. For, that's what I was looking for right there. For better, for worse. Why do you think they say that? Because there's going to be bad. There's going to be worse. And when you make this vow right now, you're vowing that when that time comes, I'm going to still be here. I'm still going to be running the course. I'm still going to be running the, ba the you know, fighting the battle. I'm still going to be here, even when it gets hard, even when it gets bad, even when there's adversity. You still need to finish the course. You need to finish it all the way, even through the adversity. It's, it's embarrassing and it's shameful. If you've begun the Christian life and discipleship, don't bail out. Don't, you know, the priorities need to be the ministry and the work of the Lord. That's what's important. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you. Uh, for being the perfect example for us and, and truly becoming flesh and, and, uh, and enduring the adversity and the contradiction of sinners, even unto blood, dear Lord. So you could be a perfect example for us. Uh, and uh, even if it comes that, to that point where possible uh, um, you know, persecution of loss of life even, that we can look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, as the perfect example. We thank you for the great, other great men of God, Moses and everyone else, the rubble that finished their course, Paul and John the Baptist being examples unto us. And, and uh, we, we love you. We ask you to be with us. We ask you that you would bless the Ray family and be with Brother Elliot, help him to feel better, dear Lord, and also to be with Shayla. We ask you that you would bless our church, help us to grow, help us to reach people, dear Lord, help us to, to keep our, our, our mind and our eyes on the prize, and help us to finish our course personally, our own race. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you.